Sunday in the season of Lent for 2021. As we worship together this morning, I want to thank those of you who joined us for our Ash Wednesday service, which was combined with our friends from the Bethesda Presbyterian Church and the Memorial Presbyterian Church of Fox Chase this past Wednesday evening on Zoom. We've also posted the video, the link to the YouTube recording of that worship service, if you would like to re-watch it or watch it for the first time or share it with friends or family. As we continue to worship online, please stay in contact with our congregation for announcements, weather permitting, for hopefully our return to outdoor worship at the middle and end of March and into the Easter season. As we worship this morning, please join me in our call to worship. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We come seeking your grace and healing. We come seeking divine wisdom. And we come to show our great gratitude to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we worship together. As the people of God gathered for worship, it is part of our rich tradition, every time we are together for worship, to pray before God, confessing not only of the sins that we as individuals have made, but also to confess for the sins of our congregation, our community, our nation, and our world. As we come to this time of prayer, first we join in one voice, confessing communally of the sins of the general reality of being human. And then you have the opportunity in a few moments of silence to pray specific personal and humble prayers of confession before our God, repenting, turning from your sin, and towards the grace of our Lord. Please join me in prayer. God of the covenant, as the 48 days of deluge swept away the world's corruption and watered new beginnings of righteousness and life, so in the saving flood of baptism, we are washed clean and born again. Throughout these 40 days, Unseal within us the wellspring of your grace. Cleanse our hearts of all that is not holy and cause your gift of new life to flourish once again. Grant us this through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Hear us now as we confess to you. Amen. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
we have come before God in humble prayer, seeking healing and redemption. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hear these words this morning, declaring the glory of God from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. The Affirmation of Faith We believe the covenant of grace was administered under the Old Testament by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Passover, and other types and ordinances, which did all four signify Christ then to come, and were for that time sufficient to build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, by whom they then had full remission of sin and eternal salvation. We also believe that under the New Testament, when Christ was revealed, the same covenant of grace was and still is to be administered in the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, in which grace and salvation are held forth in more fullness, evidence, and efficacy to all nations. Amen. Genesis, please first join me in prayer. Creator God, we know that you created the universe and all that is within it, and we know that you love each and every part of your creation. We thank you, Lord, that scripture records to us the stories not only of the creation of the world, but of the first people, of the first ones who had relationship with you, who did their best who failed, who were redeemed. We thank you, Lord, for the accounts of the early humans, our ancestors, for their faithfulness and righteousness, as well as the stories of when they gave into temptation and sin. We thank you, Lord, for the stories of covenant and redemption, as well as, Lord, the honest truth of how humanity has always struggled with the gift of free will. Lord, we ask you in this Lenten season, as we especially reflect upon our need for a Savior due to our sin, that you hold us accountable, that you show us your grace, and that you guide us to live in ways that are righteous and pleasing to you. We ask now that through the powerful presence of your Holy Spirit, you guide us in the reading, 
hearing, preaching, learning, and reflecting upon Scripture. Allow your living word to speak to us. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. This morning, this first Sunday in Lent, I invite you to hear words from the very early part of Scripture, from Genesis chapter 9. These words appear after the great flood, after Noah has built his ark, saved the animals and his family, spent the 40 days and 40 nights of rain, plus the additional time on the ark waiting for the water to recede. And now, thankfully, the flood is over, the water has rescinded, the sun is shining, and Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives, and the animals have now exited the ark and are on dry land. So here we find the words of scripture in Genesis 9, beginning with verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears on the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the cloud, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Now this, thankfully, is a tri the dramatic, triumphant climax of the account of the Great Flood in Noah's Ark. We know the account begins by telling us that every single person on earth had been so corrupted by temptation and given into sin to such a level that the presence of evil among humanity was so great and so overwhelming that the only intervention, the only means God had to redeem and save creation was to basically wipe everything out and start again. This is just chapter 9 of Scripture. It's in chapter 1 that the universe is created. In the time span between the creation of the universe and Noah, just a few generations, humanity has become so corrupt by the power of sin that the only way to save creation, the creation that God has made in God's image, which God loves, male and female, and every living creature on the earth, humans and animals, the only way to redeem creation, to renew it, to get it back to the good place of God's intentions, is to unfortunately destroy almost all of it. But God is merciful. And God identifies Noah as someone who is righteous in God's eyes. And God preserves Noah and his family, and then therefore their descendants, and every living creature on the earth, to be able to repopulate and renew the goodness of the earth that was intended at the first moment of creation. Now we know the reality of human nature. We know that we have free will that God has given us intellect, emotion, situations, experiences. God has given us the ability to choose how we will live and how we will respond to the things that happen to us and are said to us and to the relationships that we engage in and to the events of our world, both natural and man-made. And as a result of our responses, we either show forth the goodness of God 
who are unfortunately given to temptation and sin and do evil in response, or maybe in our neglect of response to what is happening. Now, the level of sin had gotten so great that God looked at God's creation, all the people and animals for whom God loved, and realized this was the only solution. Thankfully, in God's great mercy, humanity continued. Thankfully, in God's great mercy, animals continued. And thankfully, in God's great mercy, all the natural world continued after the flood, renewed, refreshed to begin again. But we know, as recorded in scripture, as recorded in human history, as recorded in our own generational memory, to this day, humanity has still not learned its lesson. We still give in the temptation to sin. We still do acts that are evil on purpose, and we do acts of evil through our neglect or our omission or our ignorance or our laziness. We still act in ways that do not show forth the goodness God intended. Thankfully, though, at times we do good. We do amazing, miraculous, grace-filled things in our words and our actions, in ways we go forth and are really enthusiastically involved in the world, and in ways we also bite our tongue, keep silent, hold back our aggression, or hold back our desire to push back against something in order to show grace. But we also know that the world is not perfect. Only God is perfect. And even as followers of Christ who are doing our best, we still stumble and we are still in need of a savior. It's true that after the waters receded, God made a covenant or a holy promise with Noah and all of humanity and all of creation that never again would a flood consume and destroy the earth. God did not promise that never again would there be a need to intervene. God never said that he would never come back in a way that directly stopped evil or stopped and held people accountable or tried to eliminate the evil and lift up the good. God stated that a flood would no longer be the intervention. And the sign, the symbol, the object, the thing that you could see to remind God and all of creation about this promise was a rainbow, a colorful natural phenomenon after a rainstorm. To remind us not only of the power of the rain that led to the flood and the destruction, but also of the amazing holy promise or covenant that God would not act in that way again that humanity had been redeemed and given this opportunity to return to right relationship with God. Scripture records to us in all honesty, though, that humanity and all of creation did not stay in right relationship with God. That generation after generation tried and often failed, breaking the covenant with God, breaking our right relationship, turning away from God and towards temptation, sinning, giving into evil, neglecting care of our neighbor, neglecting care of creation. And as a result, there were times when God, appropriately so, when the relationship was broken, when God held back the blessing. And there were negative consequences, not only for God's children, for humanity, but for all of God's creation, for every living thing on earth. We as the custodians of earth, we as those gifted through Adam and Eve with the responsibility of caring for creation, when we give in to sin, the consequence is not just for us as individuals or for our community or even our species. The consequence is often negative for all of creation. With this lasting impact of sin, generation after generation falling and picking itself back up again, sinning, then confessing, repenting, turning from this and back towards right relationship with God, finding blessing, and unfortunately through acts of injustice, turning away from that blessing. We have story after story, account after account of prophet and other spiritual leaders speaking God's truth, calling the people back and the ways the people either responded and affirmed that 
and say, yes, we want to be back in right relationship with God, or the ways people pushed away and turned away and rejected God's offer for reconciliation. Now, there was another time in history when the world became so evil, when the power of sin was so strong, when the majority of humanity was acting in ways that were disobedient to God, that showed a broken relationship with our Creator, that God had to directly intervene. But this time, not with a flood. As promised, a flood did not come and destroy all creation. As we prepare this Lenten season for Holy Week, for the events of Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter morning, we are preparing for another time that God had to directly intervene in the world to break the power of sin over creation. God had to intervene because the world had become so evil and corrupt that the only way to redeem or save the world and return it to God's intention for righteousness and goodness was for God to directly and tangibly and incarnationally intervene. God was born in human form in Jesus. Jesus Christ walked among us, knew what it was to be human, to be tempted, and Jesus, in human form, rejected every temptation, never gave in to sin. And thankfully, therefore, in the events of Holy Week, God once again triumphed over the power of sin. And this time, once and for all triumphed, conquering the power of sin and extinguishing forever the punishment of death for those who call upon Christ as Lord. And we give thanks for that on Easter morning and every day, knowing that our Savior has redeemed and saved us and we will also inherit the gift of eternal life. And we need, though, to remind ourselves of that amazing gift. So during the season of Lent and year-round, we look for reminders of that amazing mercy from our Lord. Now, the reminder of the amazing mercy that God offered in saving Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark, the reminder of that great act of compassion from God and redemption, that saving grace, the reminder is a rainbow. Every time we see a rainbow depicted in artwork, every time we speak of a rainbow or hear of it in poetry or song, every time we see one as a natural phenomenon in the sky after a storm, it reminds us of God's merciful gift of salvation. And so then as we prepare for the realities of the amazing gift of eternal life given to us through Jesus Christ, we look for things that remind us of that covenant, of that holy promise, that gift of eternal life. For many in the Presbyterian tradition, as part of the Protestant or Reformed family tree branch of Christianity, our image is the empty cross. Our image that stirs within our mind that reminder of the amazing ultimate sacrifice God made in Jesus Christ to save you and me and every person who calls upon Christ as Lord is this image of an empty cross. A cross where Christ hung, suffered, and was killed, but a cross that could not conquer him. For then God, through the powerful love of God, God raised Christ from the dead. And therefore, the cross is empty and has no power over Jesus or you and I anymore. It is not an instrument of death, but is it a symbol of salvation. And many of us wear it as a necklace, or maybe we have it tattooed on our body as body art. Many of us have it as a symbol in our churches, on top of our steeples, on our church lawn signs, even on t-shirts. The cross is now this image not of death and suffering and punishment, but of release from all of that. Of this amazing covenant, this holy promise, as revealed through Jesus Christ, between God and all people. So throughout this season of Lent, I invite you to think about the images of our faith. The rainbow, the empty cross, the baptismal font, the open Bible, 
The colors we use during different liturgical seasons, purple, the color of preparation in Lent. Or the other images you see. The hand-drawn image of our church building that we use in our newsletter or letterhead. Maybe the image of the empty cross on the exterior of our building. Maybe it's the image you have of our church lawn sign with the changing phrases every week. Maybe it's an image you have and you close your eyes, a memory of a particular Sunday school teacher, a particular pastor, a particular mentor or friend in the life of our faith community. Maybe it's a particular Sunday school lesson or an image you have from an evening ladies Bible study. Whatever that image may be, Maybe it's a sound. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe it is even a scent or a, a feeling, a texture. Maybe it's remembering a particular outfit you wore in a church play. Maybe it's remembering the darkness, the candlelit ambiance of the room on Christmas Eve. Maybe it's even a certain perfume another church member wears that when you smell it, it takes you to this place in time that makes you remember holy experiences. Whatever that image or smell or sound, whatever that thing is that reminds you of your faith and your faith community, I encourage you during the season of Lent to identify it. Maybe it's more than one thing and to be aware of, of what does it trigger. When you see a rainbow, what, what are the first thoughts you have? Does it take you back to being a child in Sunday school? Does it take you to summer camp? Does it take you to thinking about the Weather Channel? What does that conjure up and what does it mean based on whether it's a faithful first thought or not a faithful first thought? When you think of the empty cross, either here on our communion table, on the exterior of our building, maybe as a refrigerator magnet, a necklace, a bumper sticker. What does that conjure up? What does it make you think of? What memories come to mind involving the cross? If it's a particular sound, maybe it's a particular hymn or an instrument or even a vocalist in our choir. When you hear that, where does it take you? What kind of holy, messages, memories, thoughts, comforts, challenges come to mind. Maybe it's a family Bible worn with pages that are ripped and underlines and highlights in it that sits on your coffee table. Maybe it's your star word from this year or a previous year on your bathroom mirror. Maybe it's a bookmark. Maybe it's a paperweight. Maybe it's a photograph or a handwritten note of condolence or maybe a birthday letter or a congratulations letter you receive from another church member. Whatever the memento or object or sensation or memory is, I encourage you during this Lenten time to be aware of it, to think of what kind of promises it conjures up in who you are, in who you are as a disciple of Christ and to think about how that same object or smell or sound could be heard, felt, or seen by others. When we look at the cross as Christians, it means something significant to us. But if you're not a Christian, for many, this can be seen as an image that has no power or even a negative image. The baptismal font for many of us, it makes us feel wonderful. It reminds us of baptisms we witness, our own baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit. To others, a baptismal font can be a very foreign, confusing object that has no significance. Is it our stained glass window image of Jesus? Is it a Bible in your own home? Or a piece of art in your own home? Or a scrapbook of photos of church friends? What are these images, these sounds, these smells, these places, what do they help us remember and hold on to? like the rainbow that for generations has signified God's grace, like the cross that now for almost 2,000 years has been an image for Christians about the promise
promise of salvation and the gift of eternal life. What do you cling on to as your memento or your reminder, your image, your sight, your smell, your place, your person? What is it that triggers that, ah, oh, God's promise, that feeling and that, that affirmation, that knowledge of the Holy Spirit, God loves you and is in direct relationship with you and wants what is good for you. In this season of Lent, find that thing or things. Celebrate them, reconnect with them, share with myself and others, this is my thing, you know, this is my object, my photo, my sound, my place. It reminds me of God's great love for me. Amen. As the family of God, as those who are staying connected through prayer, I invite you to pray now with me. Let us pray. Creator God, we've come before you so humbled by your love, the gift of your grace, the presence of your Holy Spirit, the witness of your love revealed in Jesus Christ. We also come celebrating the multitude of times in human history you have intervened with your grace not only with Noah and the creatures saved on the ark, not only with those who witnessed the events of the original Holy Week, but also Lord, with all the times you have worked in our personal lives and the lives of our congregation, and the lives of our world, to remind us of your grace-filled presence, to intervene for salvation, to redeem us and save us so that we may glorify you in all that we do and say. Lord, we thank you for images, for smells and sounds and places and people who draw us closer to you, who redirect us away from sin and temptation and towards your desire for goodness for each one of us and for all of creation. God, we pray that you continue to heal all of creation, that you continue to work for good, that you continue to guide us to offer the good news to ensure that salvation is available to all people. Lord, continue to guide us as your disciples whom you taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we depart from this time of worship, Go into the season of Lent ahead of us, the beginning of the season of preparation. Go out seeking signs and reminders of the amazing promise of God's love for all of creation. Go now with the blessings of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Messiah, and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>